Tim then went on to Ambrose as a professor and is now in Thailand working with For Freedom International and also his wife, Nancy, who's not with us today, is in Thailand. And they're holistically caring for the physical, emotional, and spiritual needs of those. And so, Tim, thank you for what you've done here for so many years. And thank you for what you're doing now. Let's pray. God, we just welcome you into this place as Tim comes to speak. We thank you that you are a God who is consistent over the ages, who is consistent over all geographical locations and all times. And so we welcome you here as Tim comes to speak. We thank you for the way you've gifted him and called him. And we pray that you would speak to our hearts through him this morning. We pray for those online and in person who need a touch from you, who need physical healing, emotional healing, spiritual healing, or just even encouragement to live out a life that honors you. And we pray that you would use Unionville and Tim this morning to speak hope and life into your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I grew up in church, and I thought I would never, ever have a chance to do something like this. I've been to so many missionary kind of conferences. I always heard the missionary go, Sawadi kap, sabadi mai kap, yindi ti dai rochak. And I thought, whoa, speaking in tongues or what are they doing? And it was, they're speaking this language that they speak over in Thailand. So all I did was say, hi, how you doing? Nice to, nice to be here. Nice to meet you. Listen, uh, before we get dive into the scriptures too deep, I've got to do a couple things. I've got to take a couple business minutes. Uh, Matt, Joel, and Katie all said to say hi. Those are our children who are all in their 30s now. I have been gone a long time. So they wanted to say hi. And of course, Nancy wanted to say hi to each and every one of you. If you didn't know her, she's the better half of everything anyhow. And soon as I go somewhere to preach or serve, everybody asks, is Nancy here? And I say no, and then they walk away because <laughs> they're pretty happy with uh, just saying hi to Nancy. So I'm used to that. But... I really have to say, I was just with Bonnie and Derek Burnett just a few days ago, and they said, if you want to keep your job, because he's one of my bosses, make sure you say hi to everybody here, and I'm supposed to take Honey back for him. I thought that was just his nickname for me, but uh, that, that's really, uh, well, I think Mom Burnett sent a, sending him a jar of honey. Uh, for if Derek, if you're listening, good luck with getting that, because <laughs> he, he, honey is hard to come by, especially that Canadian creamed honey stuff. Ooh, la la, that stuff is awesome. And uh, we love it. We love it down there. So listen, we left, we left Unionville in 2001, and we felt like we were sent by you people. I can remember missions week after missions week when Dr. C used to sit right about where my water bottle is, and I was guilty and convicted every time that uh, I wasn't, we weren't going to the mission field, and so we'd go and talk to him, and he said, nope, Moore, you're staying right here. And I thought, well, so much for your motivational messages. But anyway, it finally got to us that you people... You people sent us to Ambro to teach for the last 20 years. So I was a Bible professor there, as a field education director, the pastoral theology professor, all those different kinds of things. But that's what I did. Nancy went on to work in oncology at the Tom Baker Cancer Clinic, and she continued to do that for the whole time that we were there. When the uh, Alliance National Ministry Office approached us to go overseas, we said, 
is, is it really time? Because we, we committed 40 years ago to go to the mission field. And then it dawned on me. Moses took 40 years to get to the mission field. And I'm thinking, I'm like Moses. And then the lightning hit all around me, and I realized I better back that truck up a little bit and uh, find out that I'm nowhere near Moses. But listen, we've been in Thailand, Phuket, Thailand, for the last two years. It is hot there. It is, if I haven't told you yet, it's very hot there. It's humid there, and it's very hot there, and it's, it's just really, really hot there. And uh, as a Canuck, it's just really, really hot there. And I just didn't think it would be anything like that. But listen, we work, as you saw, with the Christian Missionary Alliance. I work for a little pocket of the, uh, the international workers called Envision. And what happens is we run a... Um, like a discipleship school where students from all around the world come to us for uh, three months and uh, go through some disciples. We, they take seven courses on Old Testament, New Testament. I just teach all that stuff. And then I host, Nancy and I both host short-term mission trips, which I hope you would come and visit us sometime. You'd stay with us and we'd just show you all around Thailand. But I also pastor a church, an international church as well, uh, of expatriates. Now, the really interesting part is Nancy's work. She is sort of nursing. She's still doing a dental and medical mobile clinics in what is called Gotsari, uh, which is a um, sea gypsy village. Uh, you know those pictures that you see of those houses on stilts and fishing boats all around those little... So she works in those kinds of communities, and she goes in and does... Uh, blood pressers, blood sugars, uh, pregnancy teaching, and uh, fluoride and teeth kind of stuff. There, that's what, that's, what she, that's what she does. Plus, she disciples these gals and these people that come in from the community. So FFI, we, you've chosen, th and thank you very much, you've chosen to help us with the safe houses we deal with 130 cases a year of exploited or disenfranchised people. What's interesting, on the airplane over here from Thailand, it's just recent that the government of Thailand has come to us for Freedom International to teach uh, sexual safety in all the international schools on our island. That's huge, as I want to tell you that Thailand is one of the least reached people groups for the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's 0.01% is Christian. Out of the 69 million people that live on the island, you know what that means, right? Like, I'm not an accountant, but let me try it this way. That's only 6,900 people that follow Christ on that entire island, and we get to go into those schools with faith-based ministry to those good folks. It's amazing. We also work with what you and I would call the FBI, the Federal Bureau of Investigation to extract people out of the sex trafficking trade. And again, they came to us because of the integrity of the ministry that we've had for so long. Uh, a whopping four years, uh, but, but we've had great, tr great track record in pulling people out. So it's been pretty cool. So we have these safe houses that the kids, the children, they get taken out of the exploited situation and they come and live in the safe house. And we have safe house mums that live in those homes and teach scripture to them, plus other trades as well. We have a, we have a, I call it a barber shop, and I've been slapped a few times for calling it a barber shop. What do you call it when you put dye in your hair and curling and everything? That's it, salon. It's called a salon, and we have a bakery where we teach people how to <laughs> bake hair. Uh, we have people teach them how to uh, to be professional bakers and professional stylists. Oh, I used the right word. Ha! <sighs> you know, if somebody had told me I was going to Thailand when I worked here with, with Uncle Ken, that was the day of Rambo. You remember Rambo? All I could picture of Thailand was Rambo. 
I'm going to be in a river with those long motor, and they're there. They're actually there, and I've been on those things, but I expected people to run out of the bushes with bandanas and AK-47s and all. I grew up in London, Ontario, the forest city, uh, commonly called the Shire, where everything is all cute and nice and clean and tidy. Everything's just, ah, Thailand. All I could think is outwit, outplay, outlast. I was thinking of Survivor when I was, we were asked to go to Thailand. But we've had the privilege to be in Southeast Asia now for, for, for two years, and it has been a riot. We're known for tropical beaches, opulent palaces, ancient ruins, ornate temples displaying figures of Buddha, and a very large population. At least that's what the little flyer thing said on the airplane when I flew back to Canada, and I thought, I need some information to tell you about Thailand, <clears throat> and that's about the best I've got to tell you about Thailand, but devotionally, it dawned on me one time, just before we went, it dawned on me one morning, when we left Unionville, I was a youth pastor, and I went to be a professor at a university, and you talk about an identity crisis, I was used to walking around here in T-shirts and shorts and hockey jerseys and figuring out a hundred different games to play with marshmallows and peanut butter and all those different kinds of things. That's, that's what I did. And here I go to Bible college and I got taken aside by the president and said, Tim, you need to change your wardrobe. Uh, you're, no, you're no longer a Bible, you're, you're not. Anyway, so I had to change my, my clothing and I was so confused about who I was. I was really confused. So when we look at this text this morning, I hope you'll navigate and open your device. I can't, still can't get used to saying that. Open your device, but open your Bible. Like, it's like a book, eh? You, we have these books called Bibles. You can actually pull these out and you can write in them and everything. It's so cool. Um, but when you open your Bibles and turn to chapter 2 of 2 Corinthians, and, and I, we've had it read so wonderfully to us, which is phenomenal to have it read in, 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 in the service. So I'm just gonna, we're going to follow along that text. But as you, as you look at that, I, my identity became clear again. I'm an ambassador we're an ambassador. And if my wife were here, she'd go, what, really? You would tell people that you're an ambassador? Don't you know that ambassadors are kind of classy people? Uh, and I'd say, well, yeah, it's okay. And I'm glad you're wondering about you being an ambassador. It will help you with your identity in, in Christ. Because we, this text tells us that we're ambassadors of reconciliation. What in the world is an ambassador of reconciliation? Let's start with the word ambassador. Let me save your thumbs for a second. Don't bother Googling it because I'm paid big bucks to tell you what an ambassador is, okay? So like an ambassador just means you represent it. You represent. Uh, that's the key word in the definition of what, a, what an ambassador is. And uh, an ambassador is somebody that lives to, as a representative in a foreign land, a representative of your country in a foreign land. When you live in a foreign land, you know where the embassy is and you know where the ambassador lives because you're going to be messing around with visas all the time you're in that foreign country. And it's really important for you to understand where those people live because they're going to become your friends. An ambassador is also a dignitary of the government and is usually appointed. And they're generally respected. They're generally very, very respected because they have the ear of the authorities. They have the ear of a president, of a prime minister, of a king, perhaps even of a dictator or of a government. And their task, their task is to persuade non-Canadians that Canada is a phenomenal place to live. It's a phenomenal place to uh, work. It's a phenomenal place to have a business. It is just the, uh, I learned this word, it's the shizzle. It's the place to set up your business. 
and you represent it with a big old smile on your face, and you give everybody poutine, you talk about beavers, you talk about hockey, you talk about skating, but you just say it's the best place ever to work. Therefore, what does it take? It takes a Canadian. It takes a, a Canadian citizen, all right, that knows the culture, that knows Canada, and loves Canada, and has been shaped by Canada, and an ambassador loves to represent, loves to represent, and they decidedly determine to represent. They've made it a plan in their head and in their heart to represent their countries. Do I need to even preach any further? Because I think you know where this message is going, right? If we're going to be an ambassador of Christ, as verse 20 tells us here, an ambassador of reconciliation, you have to know God, and you have to have certain marks on you to be that to be that ambassador, and it will really help us with our identity. An ambassador, you know, represents, but an ambassador of recre uh, recreation, I was going to say, of reconciliation is all about restoring friendly relationships. I hope you get that. So here's the five marks, is what we're going to talk about is the five marks of what an ambassador is, okay? And the first one comes out of verses 11 through 15. Since then we know what it is to fear God, we try to persuade men. Whew. What we are is plain to God, and I hope it is plain to your conscience. We are not trying to commend ourselves to you again, but, but, but giving to you the opportunity to take pride in us so that, so that we can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than what is at heart. If we are, if we are out of our mind, it's for the sake of God. If we are in our right mind, it's just for you. Now listen, they know what the motive is. An ambassador, let me just say that they understand what's at stake and they understand and they know what is coming. That's what an ambassador knows. An ambassador of reconciliation knows that we should fear God. Now, let me try to act it out. It's not like, ah! it's not that kind of fear. It's like this kind of fear. It's like a wow, God. It's like, oh, wow, God. And I couldn't help it. I think Destiny's Child or Out of Eden or the Spice Girls up here, they, they took us right to the throne room. And it's so nice to, to be able to worship like that. And I just get weak needs sometimes. And sometimes I have the white man moves and I just kind of, oh, yeah, mmm. And I know angels are dancing. I know we dance before the Lord, but I, but we do that because we are wowed by what God has done. And what God has done, this text tells us, has reconciled us to him for crying out loud. And that is phenomenal because you know what you used to be like. We know what we used to be like, and yet he took the loving initiative to come and find us and have a relationship with us. Let's try this. Have you ever had a wow moment? Have you ever had a wow moment? You stand at Niagara Falls and you stand at the edge as close as you can and go, hmm, wow, that's a, lot of, that's a lot of power. Ooh, yeah. Or have you had that wow moment and you stand at the edge of the Grand Canyon and go, ooh, that's a long ways down there. But my greatest wow moment came in August 1981 where I was standing at the front somewhat like this and Nancy started coming down that aisle. And I looked down that aisle. Oh, I was supposed to be this macho kind of cool gym teacher kind of guy. She walked down the aisle, and I looked at my brother, and I looked at her, and I went, whoa. And Nancy just came down the aisle just glaring at me. She was so mad at me. But I've never seen any woman look like that. And we were going to look, well, we were getting married. I won't tell you what else we were going to do because that's probably inappropriate. But that was a wow moment for me. 
Now listen, we should have that wow kind of moment with God, our heavenly Father. Ambassadors understand that we are forgiven. Ambassadors understand that we have received mercy. Ambassadors understand that we have received grace. And it was all because of Christ's love. He loved us. He didn't want to just destroy us. He wanted to sweetly draw us to him. Do you, do you believe that? Do you live like that? Ambassadors persuade, they convince, they reason, they coax. Ambassadors lay out facts. They help people understand. They teach what God has done. They, they, the, the distance that we feel between God and you, that distance we feel between God and you, he closes that gap. That distance, he closes that gap through Christ and the death on the cross and the resurrection out of the grave and paying the penalty for sin and giving us a new life and a new identity, for goodness sakes. Verse 13 says that we're not proud, we're not arrogant, we're not crazy because we know that Jesus is coming. Ambassadors have concluded this. Ambassadors, verse 14 tells us they've concluded something that Jesus paid it all, all to him. Now you know why I was never in a worship band. <laughs> yeah, but that's as close as I can get to a song. All right, but listen, they're conclu they've concluded that that's what Jesus has done. And if you're an ambassador of reconciliation, if you've surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, you are an ambassador. You have that identity. The ambassadors are full of dignity. They get to dress up and represent. Ah, oh. Ambassadors also try to persuade. They step out of the shire, out of the forest city, so to speak. They step, out of the, they step out of the shire and try not to hide their commitment to Jesus Christ. They're bold to represent because they love God. It's not crazy to love God. So they've, they've concluded something and they're convinced that reconciliation is possible and they persuade others to be representatives and their ambassadors also compelled to be bold by love. To be bold by love. Think about that for a minute. I was trying to think of how to illustrate that to you. Recently, when we go overseas as international workers, we often put, when you're filling out your visa document, I'm just such an old person that I forgot to put international worker NGO and it asked what my occupation was. I put missionary. <laughs> oh yeah, that's a brilliant thing to do. I wished I'd thought of it intentionally to be sassy and all that kind of stuff like, God, take me to heaven now if they don't want me. But I just plain forgot. I just plain forgot and put missionary in there. And now all of our team puts missionary in there because nothing happened. I go into a Buddhist government and they just don't mind. So we know what motivates us? What motivates us is the grace of God and the possibility to have a new identity. That is pretty cool. So the second mark, the second mark of an ambassador is out of, out of verses 16 and 17. An ambassador understands the view of people. They understand they have a, a sincere view of people. They've rejected the fleshly worldview of those TV kind of glasses that we sometimes wear. Scripture uses the word worldly right here in verse 16, and that's usually a person of experience and sophistication. And they're often concerned with the values of stuff and the values of their stuff. That's the idea, the etymology, the definition of that word, worldly. But am ambassadors have corrective lenses on. They have correct lenses on, where they don't just have that breathy, fake praise whispering in between songs, but they actually hold on to the fact that Jesus is divine, that Jesus is divine. An ambassador has those corrective lenses on to see people correctly and is challenged, is challenged by his dignity 
to bow before him, to see people as sinners needing to become right before God. That's what they see. <laughs> oh, when I step out from behind the pulpit, it usually means I'm going away from my notes. And that's not a good thing, is it, Leslie? They taught us that in homiletics. So, but listen to this. Ambassadors, ambassadors understand the view of people. They understand total depravity. Total and absolute depravity. You know what I mean by that? We have, it's the only one of the biblical doctrines that we have empirical evidence for. You get that? Huh. So verse 17 goes on to say, therefore, ambassadors, these people that have been reconciled and have the ministry of reconciliation, they have become saved. Verse 17, they understand that people become saved. That's an important word. People have an opportunity to come to faith in Christ. They can be saved. They can be rescued. And when that takes place, they become a new creation. It doesn't mean like she gave me water. It doesn't mean like you become a monster or something like that. It just means that you've been made a new creation. You've been given a new life. You've been given a new identity. You've been given a new name and a new consciousness and a new direction and a task for your life. That's identity. And when I sat in my devotions one day figuring out, I'm not a youth pastor anymore. I'm a Bible professor. Ah. And now I sit in Thailand and go, I can't even read the signs here. Like, what am I doing here? I don't even know how to get gas at a gas station. Well, I, that's what, I just lied in church. I know how to get gas, but I don't know how to ask for it in Thai, right? See, I guess that's more, more what I meant. But listen, an ambassador has something to offer. An ambassador has something to offer. Let me ask you this question. Do you enjoy what you have in Christ? Do you enjoy that you have a new identity? Do you enjoy that you have a new life, a new consciousness, a new name? Do you, do you enjoy that kind of thing? Do you think living with Christ is a great place to live? As an ambassador, do you think it's a great place to live? As I get closer to going to heaven, I can't wait to actually go and live there. Nancy thinks that's kind of crass. Maybe because she thinks I don't love her anymore or something like that, but I can't wait to go up there and see what that's like. Here's the third mark. Here's the third mark of an ambassador that comes from our test. Verses 18 and 19. You can look at those as we talk about them. An ambassador that's spoken of here understands God's work in the world. See, God's in the business of restoring people. If you have given your life to Christ, you've been restored. You know what it's like. It is so relieving. Is that a word? It brings such relief to know that you're forgiven, that you do have a fresh start, and you can have a fresh start. Wait a minute. His mercies are new every morning. That's from the Bible. You have a fresh start every single day. You have a friendly relationship with the Creator, the, with the Creator God, and He's committed that message to us. That's what the text tells us. He's committed that message to us. Now I'm not going to go. Are you? Are you? taking that message of reconciliation? I think that's implied. You can figure that out from reading the text yourself. Let, let me just try to, let me try to illustrate it this way. I live outside my house is the Wat Chalong. Wat is just a, uh, just the Thai word for a Buddhist temple. Outside my, my, uh, outside my subdivision is a statue that's 45 meters high. It's 135 tons of, of marble, and it sits on top of a mountain, and it's Buddha. And his eyes are, are put in its face to make it look like he's looking all over our island. I see him every day, and when I walk my little six kilometers every morning... I always pray when I turn the corner and I see Big Buddha up there, I pray this really complicated prayer. God, knock it down. 
knock it down. And then I just keep on walking in case somebody heard and they chase me around the block or something like that. But listen, I see that big Buddha. I see the spirit houses on the lawns of people with the little red cream soda that's there and the little stairs so the spirit can get up into his little bird house kind of spirit house to live. I see those and I say, God, knock it down. And then I hear the firecrackers go off at the temple. I hear the fire to scare away the spirits. And I say, Holy Spirit, do your thing. You scare them away. We don't need any firecrackers. But scare them away. It's just, it's just, it's, it's, it's so much fun. I see them shaking their gambling sticks and kneeling before the statues of all the different Buddhist monks that have arrived. They shake their, their sticks to see what their future would be. And I say, God, spell out your name. I thought that one was pretty cool. And then I see them plant their flowers. I see them uh, do the public kneeling before a monk on the street. I hear about karma. I hear about all the different things that they take chances with. And I say, God, well, how do I represent? How do I represent? What am I supposed to do in this world? And as you saw, I, 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 we live close to Bangalore Road, which is one of the major sex trafficking streets in all the world. It's very similar to the main street in Amsterdam. You can go down that street and you would be aghast at the names of the restaurants and the bars and the women and the boys and the girls and the men that are flaunting themselves to try to make a buck. You walk down there and what are you supposed to do as you walk down that road? represent. I take a sick neighbor to the hospital who asked for a ride, who couldn't get to the hospital herself. She's so sick, I can't drive the car. Kun Tim, can you take me to the hospital? I say, yep. I jump in her car. I whip her to the hospital. And just before she gets out of the car, I grab her arm and say, can I pray for you? And she goes, no. And I go, well, you can't stop me. <laughs> but I wanted to pray for her right in the car, so I just prayed as she left the car to know God in her healing. Listen, Bangalore Road, the watch along, God can get to these people. And if we're not representing them, then they may not get to him. And you're a big part of that now. You've, the Unionville Alliance has had a history, a rich, rich history of sorting people, supporting people overseas. So we got to get to this fourth marker pretty quick here. An ambassador is somebody that understands the role that we have, verses 18, 19, and 20. This is the passage. Verse 20 is the word that is the, the, is the verse that we all know really well, or we've all heard. We are reconciled ourselves. We've been given the ministry to reconcile people. God is making his appeal to others through us. That's our task. And ambassadors exist to deliver that message. Yeah? We live in Canada to do business. We think it's great. We love it. We live in the kingdom of God. We love it, and we think it's great, and we're going to represent. That's what we're doing, to live with God. That's our business is to, to, to indicate that God is great. In my neighborhood, I've already indicated that I walk every morning. When I started walking every morning, it was for my own mental health, really, and because I like mangoes and I like all the sweets that you have in Thailand, I had to do something. So I walked through the neighborhood, and us Farongs, people kind of look at us and kind of step away a little bit. But I'm a Canadian. What do Canadians do? <laughs> I'm waving to everybody as I'm walking down the street. It's the best I got. I can't talk, but I wave. I just think get waving to people. And it's taken two years but those people that I'm waving to, there's about 15 to 20 of us that walk our neighborhood in the morning. Uh, 15 of those 20 people, we've had three of those couples in our house for, get this, Christmas dinner and Thanksgiving. Ah, you, you talk about getting into a spiritual conversation with somebody, especially when you sit down and read the Christmas story to everybody at the Christmas dinner table. It is hilarious. They just kind of, they just, they just don't know what to do. They just do not know what to do, but it's not difficult. It's not, I wish I could say I knew they were all in the kingdom today, 
but I, I can't say that, but we're on their way. We're getting in those spiritual conversations. You know what I'm saying? Uh, you represent a foreign power. As an ambassador of reconciliation, your identity is that you represent the foreign power. You've been forgiven. You've been redeemed. Uh, you've been sanctified, rectified, purified. And uh, I mean, I could go on with the fides. But you've got all of those. That's your identity. That's your identity. You represent a foreign power. Uh, are you impressed with other ambassadors? Like ambassadors that work for the government, we go, oh, this is ambassador. And you go, wow, you're that for Christ's sake. That is pretty cool. Let me introduce you to young Albert. He came to, to, to Phuket, where we live, to, uh, I just lost the word, Muay Thai. And kick, kickboxing, yeah, you can tell I'm good at um, he, he came to, from the UK, and he had all kinds of questions. He showed up at our church one day, and he wanted to talk to the, to the, the father. And uh, they all pointed to me. And I, so I go and talk to him. He goes, I have all kinds of questions. I like Egyptology. And for two years, we yacked and yacked and yacked about the difference between the pantheon of gods of Egypt and Jesus Christ. We baptized him about three weeks ago. And he's serving in our connection team. Like Don does his thing out here. He's Don Rowe at our church now. And we're like psyched out of our tree. He's psyched out of his tree. It's just so good. Let me introduce you to Albert the Old. He's bedridden, uh, stage four cancer. And he's mad at the world. He's a docker from the UK. And I go to visit him because that's what pastors do. And I go in and I visit him and he goes, I don't want to talk to you. And I go, okay, well, let me just sit here for a while and we'll just breathe together. And I sat down and he goes, well, you're pretty stubborn. I said, well, you're pretty stubborn. And he said, so what did you do for a living? And because I knew he was a docker in, on, on the Thames in the uh, in UK, I told him I was a prairie docker. And he went, what? And I said, I work for Rhymer Express all my summers through university. So I stripped and loaded trucks. So I'm a docker as well. Well, that just broke the ice right there because we had something in common. I didn't know that about him, but it just took the, the intestinal fortitude to go and say hi. And now I meet with him weekly and do communion with him weekly. And he just made, not just, but he made a verbal proclamation of that he is a devoted follower, disciple of Jesus Christ, much to his wife's pleasure, because she was solid, but she never knew where he stood. So let me throw another question at you. Can you say this? Can you say this? I have been reconciled with Christ. See, if we were out in that building that used to be called the armory, or if we were downstairs in the room, what we used to call it, the pit, oh, I took a lot of flack for that. But anyway, we called it the pit and we called it the armory. I would pause and say, okay, now, boys and girls, repeat after me. Uh, can you say, I've been reconciled with Christ? Can you say, I am a new creation? Can you say, I am his ambassador of reconciliation? Because you are. That is, the, that is a good move and motivation to understand your new identity in Christ. And here's the fifth and the last mark of an ambassador. Whew. And it comes out of verse 21. Now, listen, there has been a lot of ink spilt on verse 21. It's a pretty important passage. It might not be the most politically correct passage in today's world, but it says, it tells us that we're cut off from God. And sin does that, doesn't it? You know that significant person that you love. If you, you, if you got some ought against each other, you, you go to bed at night and you just don't move. You don't know who's going to be the first one to roll over. Who's, you, know, you just don't bump them or anything like that. You, you just, yeah. It's just that way, right? You don't want to give in first, but you're cut off. You're cut off. And you have, you have convictions, some criminal convictions against you, and you're guilty. That's what the message of God is. And the message is that Jesus can make it right. Jesus can make it right. And he is that atoning sacrifice. He propitiated 
that sin. He averted the wrath of God so that God can look directly to you and give you eternal life and give you peace with him. And that's what an ambassador gets to talk about because we've lived it. We've experienced it. Do you remember that truth about you? Do you remember that truth about you? Of what was undertaken on your behalf? Do you get that? What was undertaken on your behalf? That's a loving initiative that gives you this new identity. And it's, it's not, it's not an unfamiliar story of the great general from Mesopotamia. His name was Alexander the Great. And one of his soldiers like ran away from battle. They captured him. Or he captured him and they threw him on the ground in front of Alexander. And he said, I can't believe what you did. And he said, what's your name? And the kid that was laying on the ground before Alexander the Great said, my name's Alexander. And I mean, it's such a cool youth ministry story. Alexander looked at him and said, well, change your name or change your ways. You see, when we came to Christ, we got a new name. You were Tim Moore Christian, Les Miata Christian, Don Rowe, Cheryl Rowe Christian, Winston Christian. We, we, we have that name given to us, and that is a new identity. Change your name or change your ways. So what is it I've been trying to do? What have I been trying to do this morning? I'm trying to remind us that you've been reconciled by God, and that's a gift. I'm trying to motivate you to represent because you have this new identity and you have this new life. I've been trying to get you to enjoy the confidence in living with God rather than against him. Because you have this new identity, you are convinced, you can conclude, you can persuade, you have been compelled by God's love. You can at least wave to people. Yeah? You can at least wave to people. You've been given the ability. You've been given the strength. You've been given the Savior. You've been given the sanctifier. You've been given the king. You've been given the healer to be that ambassador for him. So here's the question. Will you? Will you? Let, let, let's do it together. Let's turn the world upside down before he gets back. Ah, that would be such a hoot, right? So, Lord Jesus, here we are. Your word tells us that we have this new identity, that we've been forgiven, and that's so refreshing and so reassuring and gives us so much peace. Help us to believe that we have been forgiven. Help us to understand that we have been made right. We have been, we have been put in a happy place before you. We're no longer got that chasm between you, you and I, and we can go and with uh, humble confidence with humility and yet confidence and boldness wave to people and see what transpires. May we be able to talk about the reconciliation, the, the faith that we have in you and thank you for the motivation and the marks of, of being these ambassadors where it's spelled out very clearly that we have this identity to be an ambassador. Oh, when, when somebody comes to us, Lord Jesus, in a discipling situation, says, what am I supposed to do with my life? May we instantly say, well, you're supposed to be an ambassador for Christ. And may we get on with that work for your sake. Lord Jesus, we just pray all this in your name. Amen.